and dance with Victoria's e High School. The winners swept the competition, earning their second grand slam. Last Friday, the Lady Days volleyball team won the district championship. They have won five consecutive district championships. The Blue Jays football team was also victorious. They won their district championship last Saturday, November 5th. They will advance to the next level, playing Brother Rice this Saturday. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, and now for South of Lake High School, it's Rachel Webb. Hello. Um, October 13th was the Princeton Review Free Sports Strategy Session. This is where the students review their test scores and answer documents along with the Princeton Review Strategy Coaches. Um, on October 27th were the Fall Parent Teacher Conferences from 3.30 to 5.50 and again from 6.30 to 8.30. Um, on October 29th, Nas the National Honor Society hosted the annual Halloween Blue Rock, and there was a really good turnout. Um, I think it's about 20 kids for them. Exciting. On November 2nd, we began our canned food drive. Um, today, November 9th, this, um, Dr. Sessions from Livingstone College conducted auditions for our senior musicians. Yesterday, South Lake for girls basketball team started child. Um, and again, today, November 8th, the International Baccalaureate <coughs> extended essay in creativity action. Service teachers met with the students to make sure they were on track with these two parts of the diploma program. Um, tomorrow, November 9th, will be the National Honor Society Fair <coughs> Night. On November 11th, will be our first blood drive of the year, sponsored by the Student Congress. And on November 29th, will be our National Honor Society induction ceremony in the auditorium from 7 to 8.30 p.m. November on November 11th, excuse me, the One Act play is Sorry Wrong Number and What Are We Going to Do with Mama will start at 7 p.m. And on November 12th, will be the Good Intentions One Act play. And then December 9th will be the Winter Dance Concert at 7 p.m. in the auditorium. That concludes my report. Thank you. Um, we also have on our agenda uh, recognition <coughs> uh, by the board of our superintendent. On Friday, November the 18th, the Torch of Wisdom Foundation will present its Changing Tomorrow Today, recognizing local heroes awards to our superintendent, Dr. Wanda Cook Robinson, as a local hero because of her diligent work in education for the positive difference she is making and improving the lives of many individuals and to recognize her as a strong role model to young African American youth. This event will provide an opportunity to raise community awareness about the successes of South Dakota Public Schools. We congratulate our superintendent, Dr. Wanda Cook Robinson, on this award. Thank you.
but it's an annual fundraiser, one of our largest, where we like to bring awareness and celebrate survivorship for those who are in touch with cancer. Um, we hold it annually, and last year it was held at the Southfield High School uh, field and track. And uh, we raised a considerable amount of money. I'm going to let Chiar give you a little bit of information about how much we raised. But more importantly, what we wanted to recognize the participation of the Southfield Public School System and the high school students that participated in last year's relay. We want to thank them for their efforts. And I'm going to let Chiar run down the list really quickly of the teams and how much money they raised and what that uh, partnership and support looked like. Thank you, Dana. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Chiara Clayton. I am the Southfield Area Community Representative with your American Cancer Society. And first of all, I just want to thank this body for allowing us to come, to your superintendent and to everyone here. Um, thank you very much for allowing us to come today. We really just want to say thank you, as Dana said. Relay for Life is our signature fundraiser that we do across the country. And it's how the American Cancer Society is, raised, is able to raise the funds that we do to fund cancer research and free services to those dealing with cancer. And last year, um, with the city of Southfield, we really partnered with the Southfield Schools. And I'm happy to say that the Relay for Life raised $30,000 right here in Southfield last year for the American Cancer Society. That's good, right? <laughs> and we had 24 teams that um, made up our walkers. And out of those 24 teams, seven of those were from Southfield Public Schools, Southfield High School specifically. So we wanted to say thank you for that. And out of that $30,000, the Southfield Schools were able to raise just over $6,000 of that. So can we raise a you know, round of applause for that? <laughs> and I just wanted to highlight the schools that participated and say publicly thank you. Um, I'm going to start with first saying thank you to Southwood High School. We utilize the track to have the walk. We actually use that site as our venue. So we want to say thank you um, to Southwood High School. But I really wanted to highlight Southfield Labor High School because out of our seven school teams, Labor made up five of those teams. So we just wanted to say thank you for that. And we also had Southfield Regional Academy, and also we had um, University High School to also participate. So we just wanted to come and say thank you and let the board know what your schools are doing. Um, I heard the two reports from the two young ladies in the high school, so you guys are doing big things. But you're also giving back to the community. So we felt it very important to kind of highlight that, to say that students and young people, and they really kept our event going. Relay for Life is a 24-hour walk, so people come, they camp out for 24 hours over the course of a weekend at Southwood High School track, and they take turns walking the track, the teams that are there, and out of those either battling cancer, those that have been lost to cancer, and to raise awareness for cancer. And out of the 24 hours, I can say that the high school students kept it going. They were up all night, they walked all night, <laughs> surprisingly, right? <laughs> But they not only were up, but they walked, they participated. We had a 15-year-old cancer survivor from Southfield Lake of High School who walked in our survivor lab. His name is Brandon, and he's, um, his family was there. And it was just really, really touching to see not just adults, but youth from this community participating. So that's really why we're here, to say thank you to those schools. And we have a student here. I'm sorry. Come here. Come here. She was actually a team captain. This is Sheree, she's team captain from Southfield Labor, so she's here kind of representing the students. And I'd love for her to share, because we don't have a lot of time, if you could share quickly your experience and what it meant to be a team captain. Hello, everyone. My name is Sheree Jefferson from Southfield Lathrop High School. I was the team captain for the Southfield Lathrop High School Rosies. We're a committee within our NHS. And to me, um, this is my second year chairing this committee within NHS, and we participated in Relay for Life in my 10th grade year, and we didn't go, you know, full force with trying to collect money and raise awareness, so when I got the opportunity to chair the committee, I was like, you know, we got to do better, so I um, kind of pumped my girls up, we're, we're a group of young ladies and we try to aware people, raise awareness about women and uh, things that deal with women and try to uh, mentor the girls within our school about certain issues and cancer touched me personally with some of the women in my family and I just knew that this was something that I wanted to be a part of so when 
we got the opportunity to participate again. I just knew that we had to go full force this time. So we're going to do it again this year. And I just want to say that we were the top high school team. All right. <laughs>
ourselves with the assistance of our Director of Technology, Howard uh, Buzo, uh, to investigate these concerns that the student brought up. Uh, what was revealed was that there were a couple isolated incidents at the building um, that we wanted to address in our uh, my speech with you tonight. Uh, there were, for some students, about four or five students, there were issues with blocks on websites for, um, that was required uh, for students to be able to access in order to complete um, work for their online class. We worked with ITC, that has now been resolved. Um, there was, on the part of the online preventer, uh, vendor, uh, students that enrolled in AP Physics and AP Chemistry courses, there were several textbooks that had been delayed for delivery. Again, working with the Tennessee Intermediate School District and the provider that too was resolved. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the online provider in Tennessee uh, Intermediate Schools actually refunded the district monies for those textbooks as well as for the course enrollment for those students affected. Uh, I actually had an opportunity to meet with parents directly at Southfield Lake High School uh, during their parent-teacher conferences to address any type of issues. Uh, I only met with four parents. Um, parents seem to be very satisfied with the actions of the district and the actions of the building administration. Um, in addition to uh, these measures, we also worked with, um, with the principal as well as with Ms. Wood uh, to provide students in AP Physics and AP Chemistry courses with additional lab time uh, to complete required lab assignments. So there's now a program for those five students. Uh, they meet Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday in the morning from, uh, before school starts from 7 in the morning till 7.45 approximately. Um, this is in addition to the course time they have during the regular school day, but we felt it was really important to make sure that we gave those students all the time that they needed to complete their required lab uh, experiments and so on and so forth. Uh, to date, our investigation has revealed uh, through Aventa as well as Genesee ISD, my office as well as with ITC, there was no errors in course content relative to the tests that were being taken by students. Um, this was a two-week investigation that was conducted by the provider of Aventa Learning uh, speaking with the online teacher of the student that was affected. Um, and again, it appears that there was a miscommunication in terms of uh, being able to access online materials in the course, e-textbooks, so on and so forth, but there was no uh, evidence of any error in content for those courses. Nonetheless, Aventa agreed because of the number of students we have enrolled in online courses to refund the course costs and also to uh, provide students with a new teacher if they so chose. I'm not sure if that happened, uh, but that was an option presented. Uh, the main point is that with any new program, um, there are some hiccups, and I definitely want to acknowledge that. However, uh, in terms of the broadness of those hiccups, if you will, there were very few students affected. Uh, I definitely apologize to those students and their families. Um, they seem to be satisfied with the actions taken by my office as well as the actions taken uh, at the building level. And that is the conclusion of my report, unless there are any questions from the members of the board. Okay. No, they are taking the courses. No, we have, in, within the district, we have approximately 270 students that are enrolled in online courses, whether they are seat high waiver, meaning completely online in high school, or taking one or two courses in comprehensive high schools. Um, our execution on the district side of enrollment of students uh, was textbook perfect. There were issues on the part of the content provider in those isolated instances, as well as the intermediary agency, Genesee Intermediate School District, which has um, the regulatory oversight of the state seat time waiver program. Because of that, Genesee, as well as Aventa, agreed to refund the district any costs incurred for those students as a courtesy. But those students are enrolled in the courses. They have their textbooks, they have their lab kits, they have all the materials. It's just that in an act of good faith and goodwill, Genesee and the course provider agreed to reimburse the district and refund us for those costs in those in the instance of those five students. Absolutely. I'll be 
you're more than happy to come back to the board um, if you want every month. That's perfectly fine. Okay. I'm just offering it. Thank you. I wanted to update the board on the situation that we had at Gurney. Uh, for those in the community that are not aware, about a week ago Sunday, at about 10.30 in the morning, as I prepared to leave for church, I received a phone call that our boiler at Gurney was under about seven feet of water. Um, when I got to the building, um, it was truly flooded. And the team was already there, led by Dennis Gregory, who has done an outstanding job, he and Leslie Smith, on handling this problem. What we did, we got the insurance and the restoration folks in to start cleanup, but we also had to look at what was the cause of the problem. What happened at Burning was that under the computer room, the pipe that flows up under there burst, and so water was then being released. When the boiler was submerged, it hit the alarm, and that's what told us something was wrong. So we had to close school on Monday and Tuesday. On Wednesday, it looked like we might be able to open, but we had to test the air quality. So, to make sure that everything was fine before the students returned, I closed school for the entire week. Now, that did cause some hardship on parents, and so we have been working with Champion so that we can find a solution to the latchkey or the daycare issues that they have. And I'd like to share with the board the resolution that we have come to. The Southfield Public Schools Administration and board and Champion are committed to partnering to help get the lives of families back to normal after our situation at Bernie. Understanding that you were forced to make other arrangements for your children and in some cases incur additional expenditures, Southfield Public Schools and your champion family have arranged a one-time credit for last week's tuition. Southfield Public Schools will contribute funds on the behalf of all of those parents and champions will process credit for the remainder of the balance. This measure will enable the children to attend programming with no interruption and more importantly, no financial burden on the parents. So I want to say thank you to Champions also for working with us so that we could support our parents. I'd also like to share with the board this evening just a snippet of an opportunity that I had last month. The mayor of Southfield, Mayor Brenda Lawrence, called and asked if I would accompany her <coughs> on a mission with the U.S. delegation of mayors to Saudi Arabia. While there, they would not only um, interact around business opportunities, but have an opportunity to visit the school system and to and universities and to look at how things are done there. What you see on the screen here is the entire go back go back one the entire delegation that went. I was a guest of, of Mayor Lawrence, as you see in the picture, and the person here is the prince. The king of Saudi Arabia was in New York at the time. So the Prince was our host, and we were hosts of the King, and the Saudi American, uh, I'm sorry, the Saudi American King paid for all of our expenses, airfare, lodging, and so on. Upon our second day of arrival, we had an opportunity to meet with the U.S. Ambassador, James Smith, who was very, very helpful to us in understanding the culture and how we would have to interact with the um, government officials, and community members that we met there. Just to tell you a little bit about Saudi Arabia, it's about one-fifth the size of the United States, has a population of about 28 million. It's primarily desert um, with a rugged mountain terrain, and it has extreme temperatures um, in the interior and humidity and temperature on the coast. So we were able to go on the coast, see the Red Sea, and that temperature was more like Orlando. thought I was going to faint. Um, but when we were in the capital city, it was more like Arizona, sort of a, a, a dry heat. We had an opportunity to meet with the Minister of Education and exchange some ideas. He was a little surprised that I was a woman and in charge of a school district. <laughs> so we had some conversation uh, about that. But had an opportunity to really get a bird's eye view of their educational system. They have two systems that coexist there a public system and a private system, but both are supported by the government. 
They begin with pre-primary education, which is their uh, version of kindergarten for ages three to five, but this is not a prerequisite <laughs> for going to first grade. School actually starts at age six. All national primary schools are day schools and they are not co-educational. <coughs> boys and girls are educated separately. However, they do have discussions underway to allow female teachers to instruct both boys and girls in grades one through three. Now, the students must pass an examination at the end of grade <coughs> six. This is their primary school part of their education to obtain an elementary education certificate. They cannot go on to the middle school years without that certificate. Their intermediate or middle school education is three years past the elementary certificate, and their secondary education phase is three years past the intermediate stage. Now, the three years that they do at the secondary um, portion is considered their final stage of general education. At the completion of their general education, students have three options. They can consider what they call special secondary education, which is technical, a technical secondary institute, which provides technical and vocational education and three-year training programs in the fields of industry, commerce, and agriculture. They also have another option, which is to go to the university. They have 24 government-supported universities in Saudi Arabia offering diploma, bachelor's, master's, and Ph.D. degrees. They also have an option to study abroad. And currently, Saudi Arabia has approximately 120,000 students attending colleges and universities worldwide, all supported by the government, their room and board, as well as their education. <laughs> Me too. Their private um, education system is under the auspices of the Department of the Ministry of Education. They supervise the private schools for boys and girls. The government provides free textbooks and annual financial aid to their private schools. And the government appoints and provides funds for a qualified director in all of their private schools. One of my burning questions was the education of women. We found that the education for girls and women was established in 1960, and they had their first group of women to graduate from a law program in 2008. Uh, the women who graduated from the law program are not able to practice law in the country, but they can assist female clients. We had an opportunity to visit the um, EFAT University for Women, where they had the first engineering program in the country, and you can see the delegation taking a picture um, in front of the university. And, you know, it's a very, very modern Western country. And that was something that I was surprised about. You know, if, if you didn't see the Arabic writing, you wouldn't know that you weren't in Orlando or you weren't in Las Vegas, the way the buildings look. Because many of their um, engineers were educated here in America. But an interesting note, while we were there, Women receive the right to vote and to run for office. And this is a picture with two of, w of the women who are participating in government, and they were very, very excited about having this opportunity to run for office and to have the vote, but women are still not allowed to drive cars. So my next question was, how are you going to get to the voting place <laughs> to vote? And they said, not a problem. This is, this is not an issue. They were sure that um, they were going to get there. Uh, I want to thank Mayor Lauren for providing this opportunity um, for me. It was interesting um, to watch not only the business side, but the educational as well. I also brought artifacts and souvenirs back for the board. Mm -hmm. Did you have here? Mm -hmm. Questions? Do you have a question? Oh, showing her. Art <laughs> but it was, it was very, very oh. exciting experience. At this time, I'd like to invite Mr. Mike Bajinski and the team to come up and to give the board an update on our strategic plan.
Well, I'll just throw four kind of, kinds of pieces of information at you tonight and just say that in the last year, we've seen a 5% decline in student enrollment. And as you know, X number of dollars per, per student is, is gone. The second area there really intrigued us. Uh, what we saw was a 30% uh, movement of teachers around the district. Now, one of the things that happens when you have movement and mobility is that you want to make sure your educational program, your instructional program, has some degree of standardization within it. Because as people are moving around, the stability factors that affect people when they move have, have great impact. And we're trying to minimize it as much as possible. The third area, I don't have to tell you, 24 million last year, over 60 million dollars in cuts over the last four years. 66, excuse me. I said over 60, I was right. Close to 70 million dollars over, over the last uh, few four years is a major uh, challenge. Now, what I want to say about that is, though, that there are a lot of organizations when faced with those kinds of resource cuts really kind of sit back, worry about getting through uh, the day to day. I'm working with about uh, five districts right now in this area of strategic planning in a couple of different states. And one of the things I can tell you is that what, what really I think sets your plan uh, in, in a different stride is that not only is it focused on continual improvement in classrooms, but no one's suggesting at all that this has, has not caused issues or problems, but people in this district have an attitude that we can sit and talk about this, but it's not going to do much good. So we're moving ahead. We're not going to stand still. We're a good school district. We want to become a great school district, even though this is happening to us and there's been a great deal of disruption. I guess my final point about that is that there's been a lot of change that's occurred in the three years since we wrote this strategic plan. And we're going to have some recommendations for you at the end that I think will, uh, will uh, help, I think, put things in focus. The last thing, and, and Howard's going to talk about this a little bit, is that our ParaConnect contacts are up tremendously uh, over the past year. These are year-to-year -year comparisons, so we're using last year as a benchmark. And I think that uh, he has some more details about how that looks. So, there we go. Thank you, Mike. Board of Education, Superintendent, members of the community. One of our strategies is to engage parents through effective communication. We use traditional methods like parent-teacher conferences, telephone calls from principals and teachers, uh, notes from the classroom, but technology offers us so many more tools. We have the school district website, the, the cable access channels, we can use our Honeywell instant alert system to broadcast a telephone message to all of our parents within just a few minutes. Parent Connect is another tool that we have. Parent Connect allows parents to log into a website and see grades and attendance and other information about their students. And we've got some statistics here to show usage from last year and this year. You can see that our usage is up 72% over last year. And that's very encouraging. In fact, it, it's up quite a bit at the K-8 level. Um, another tool that we have is called Student Connect. Student Connect allows students to log into that same website and see their own grades and attendance and, and other information. Um, Student Connect usage is, is double what it was last year, and at the middle school level, it's up four times. Our, our middle school students are using it four times as much as they did last year. One of the questions we had was, at what grade level do students suddenly become interested in their grades to take an interest to see how they're doing? And what you can see here is, is very encouraging. It's at the seventh grade level. We expected it to be maybe at the ninth or tenth grade level, that oh my goodness moment where, okay, this GPA is gonna last with me all through high school, but our seventh graders are interested in the progress, and that's very encouraging. And you can see how it goes up from there. Our statistics show that, on average, our high school students are using this tool twice a week. Twice a week, they're checking their grades in attendance, and that's very encouraging for us. I'd like to introduce Alma Dean, a PD facilitator, who will uh, continue our presentation. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I want to thank the superintendent, the board, 
and the community. I'm excited to share this information with you. It's really inspirational. We started off with a question. As we go back and we look at professional development, and we knew that we, need to, we needed to help move our teachers forward with that, so we began with the question that's in the corner in the thought bubble. What are the professional development needs of teachers? And as we approached um, that question, we weren't really thinking in the terms of content, but what do we need for teachers that will help support them and move them, them forward through the process of implementing differentiated instruction into their classroom? So we identified five areas that were really strong <clears throat> in helping moving them forward. The first at the top of the circle is the con contextual aspect. And what that simply means is the professional development that we had this year and last year for our teachers were building-based and classroom-based. That's very significant. So we, as PD facilitators, came to our teachers' buildings, the various buildings in the district, and we held our professional development sessions right there in their facility, which gave them a little bit more of a, um, a comfortable atmosphere, and they were a little bit more open with us with that. We also identified the need for collaboration. And what happened with that aspect of it, the teachers would meet in grade level groups or content area groups, small groups which were about uh, maybe three, four teachers at a time, and that allowed them to feel a little bit more comfortable opening up and speaking in regards to what was actually going on in their classroom. That also allowed teachers an opportunity to speak about things that were more relevant to what they were experiencing. The third element we identified was the authenticity of it. Although this year and last year as well, I'm serving in the capacity of, of a um, PD facilitator. At my very core, I'm still a classroom teacher. And so that was something that we felt the teachers really appreciated, teachers supporting other teachers. And the fourth element was reflection. It was a very reflective process. It still is. So teachers really ask themselves, how does this relate to my classroom and my students? Each element that we presented to them through the professional development, they were able to reflect on it and how it affected them personally. And the last of the five areas was um, it was sustained. This wasn't something that happened once during the course of the year. It was ongoing. We were in their buildings regularly holding PD sessions as a group and even doing <coughs> individual sessions with teachers where we would come into their classroom and demonstrate how to teach a particular lesson or how to implement um, things like flexible groups or routines. And it happened um, throughout the school year. We also had summer sessions that were very successful. And as you can see, in the center of all of this is teacher belief. Because the truth of the matter is you can have all of the professional development you want, but if you don't, at the core of who you are, have a strong belief about what you're doing and who you're teaching and their ability to be successful, it really doesn't amount to much. So that's, I, I think, one of the largest things that came out of it. We were able to see teachers move in the direction toward having a positive um, belief about what they were doing. Now, you also see in the arrow that's going through there, and it was mentioned earlier, there was a great deal of teacher movement over the last few years. So you have primary teachers, teachers from um, elementary, middle school, now teaching in high school, and vice versa, you have high school teachers teaching in elementary. You also have teachers who are out of their um, comfort areas as far as their content is concerned. You have um, teachers who formerly taught science, maybe teaching social studies and things like that. And although they're certified for those areas, it may have been a while um, since they taught in that particular area. So that was another opportunity to support the teachers. And that's really what this whole um, professional development model is about, supporting teachers and helping them to grow. And most of the time when you see things like that with the teacher movement, it is, as was mentioned earlier, a comfortable a, a season for change and teachers are, you know, some are having a difficult time with it. But I am excited because I have seen uh, middle school math teachers teaching kindergarten and really going at it full throttle. We also have a high school counselor who's now teaching first grade and doing a phenomenal job. So at the, there's always, in my opinion, a silver lining to everything, and teachers are supporting each other. And another great thing that I've seen develop out of this is that 
quite often it would be a concentrated group of really strong educators, maybe a fourth grade team in a building that had four teachers that were all really strong. Well, some of those teachers are now in different places. So we see an element of capacity building where they're taking that strong um, tenant that they had and moving to another building and developing that same, a new team that's just as strong in a new place. So it's, it's a positive that is developed out of something that could have potentially not been so positive. Does anyone have any questions? I'm really excited about this, and I, I apologize if I missed anything, but I know we have to be brief. We have I can go on. We have a teacher survey that's underway as well. We do. We do have a teacher survey that's in, um, underway right now. Part of the reason we know that this is working, we received a lot of feedback from teachers. In the beginning of this process, a lot of teachers were apprehensive about letting us into their classroom and speaking to them about things. Now we get emails, phone calls. They are inviting us in and inviting each other in. So it's a whole different mentality. But again, it goes back to the center of it. The beliefs are changing. Does anyone have any questions? I know you do. <laughs> no questions? Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm Terry John, the principal at Vandenberg World Cultures Academy, and the part that I want to talk about is, um, okay, so the strategic plan sets the target over a five-year period, and then there's all this pre professional development, which was strategy four, relating to strategies two and three, which were good <laughs> instruction. So the teachers are getting lots of support. How does it come to life in a building when the PD facilitators leave and the summer sessions are over? So it's really about good teaching. And at the top, I have the district strategic implementation of differentiated instruction includes training and support over time, monitoring for results. So some of those supports have been um, cadres one, two, and three which were small teams from each building in cadre one, and then different teams from each building in two, and different teams in cadre three, who were trained over the course of a year, multiple opportunities to learn about differentiated instruction. Summer classes, and Alma referred to that. Out of the cadres came demonstration teachers. Every building had at least one. Some buildings had two. They received extra training, extra support, and extra technology to really ramp up their practice in this quest to build the capacity district-wide. On top of that, um, lots of leadership training, not only for teachers to become teacher leaders, but for principals to become instructional leaders. Lots of work around reflective practitioners and reflective practice. I wouldn't want to go to a doctor who, after a surgery, didn't say, what could I have done better? What went well? What do I need to know for the next surgery that's like that that I don't know yet? And it's taking that model. I wouldn't want to go to an accountant. I wouldn't want to go to any professional who wasn't a reflective practitioner so it's putting in place lots of things at the district level, including um, Take One in the National Board certification process um, to ramp up teachers' abilities to be reflective practitioners and truthfully principals' abilities to be reflective practitioners as well. As well as Saturday sessions, some weren't enough, so we threw in a bunch of Saturday sessions. Um, for people to learn more and get supported more. And then this year, um, a standardized lesson plan template with all the components of differentiated instruction and in terms of building the capacity so that our schools are more like each other than not like each other and our classrooms are more like each other than not. 
if we're all planning using the same template and considering the same components when we're designing instruction, the, um, the outcome has got to be better for children. So then at the, in the bottom blue bar, the way I see this in my head, the district has the target, and that's in the middle, the star, five pillars of differentiated instruction. And if you look around the circles, the five tenants in the classroom are flexible groups of students. There is some whole group instruction going on in classrooms, but it's a very small amount of the time. And then the classroom environment that is safe and respectful and responsive to students. Um, and uh, where students feel comfortable being learners, taking risks where students are comfortable helping each other, where students are comfortable saying, I don't understand this yet. Or, you know what, I, I got it. I understand it now. Give me something else. And the teacher says, okay, I'm going to give you something else, instead of, no, something else comes Friday. If that student is ready for something else on Tuesday, that student deserves something else on Tuesday. High quality curriculum and lots of work throughout the district around KUDs. Those are statements. The K is no, the U is understand, and the D is do. What will students know? The understanding is why do they need to know it? What will they understand? What's the really big idea in the knowing? And what will they do to prove they understand it? And teachers have been working on KUDs um, for several years now. Respectful task, and that kind of goes back to classroom environment and high quality curriculum. Students come in knowing all kinds of different things. And they don't all need to learn the same things because some of them come in knowing some of those things. So it's incumbent upon teachers to figure out what kids know and understand and what they need to know and understand and then differentiate accordingly. And ongoing assessment <coughs> is really important so that we're pre-assessing to make sure we know what they know. We, as they're working, we're forming opinions of, through their work about what they are learning and understanding. And then at the end, modifying what we're doing as teachers in response to what students are telling us along the journey. And then the summative assessment at the end where we, you know, the test or the project or um, whatever the ultimate assignment is. So, in order to make that happen in the classroom, in conjunction with what Alma already told you is happening in PD, and the green arrows up there for what the district is providing in the way of support, it's important that at the building level they're getting support when the PD facilitators aren't there. So I'm going to tell you what are some of the things that are going on at Vandenberg, and there are things just like it and others going on in every building in the district. Um, faculty meetings, we all have them. And they're not FYI kind of meetings anymore. Uh, the FYI stuff goes out in an email. The faculty meeting, precious time when you have everybody together to do professional development uh, experiences. Um, grade level team meetings. Once a week I meet with my grade level team. And we're always talking about one or more of those pink bubbles you see around the circle. Peer observation. My teachers are going into my demonstration teacher's classroom, having facilitated conferences with her as a group before the observation, looking at her lesson plan, then actually watching her teach, and it's videotaped while she's teaching it, and then a facilitated post-observation conference where her brain is picked, um, she's encouraged to be reflective, observers' questions are getting answered, and there's always the video for backup if, if, if there are questions. I'm not so good with this clicker. Um, one of the things that I think is really important when we ask Oh, there we go. I pressed it a bunch of times and they're coming up all at once now. Um, it's really important for me as a, when I'm a learner 
to have models. So if I want my teachers to ramp up their ability to differentiate, it's important to me that I model for them. So my teachers don't get typical staff meeting <coughs> agendas anymore. They get a KUV agenda. My agenda tells them what they're, what they're going to know, why they need to know it, and what they're going to do to prove they understand it. So, um, and I try to use the strategies that I would want them to use in the classroom, and then we debrief the process. So this is one, uh, yet another way <laughs> for them to see how differentiation works. In my grade level team meetings, the agendas aren't the same for every grade level because the grade levels aren't all in the same place. So the, those conversations are differentiated. Um, I collect KUD statements, one per grade level, which forces the grade level conversation for each core content each week. And also an individual teacher's lesson plan for the week related to those commonly developed grade level KUDs. Um, the facilitated debriefs are really important, and we debrief after staff meetings, we debrief after grade level team meetings, and obviously we debrief after observations. The, that forces the reflection and brings to the surface the question, um, makes people hopefully comfortable being vulnerable and publicly willing to take a risk. Um, I do. <coughs> I mean, I plan my agendas, I write my KUDs, and at the end we talk about, so how did it go? And I'm telling you, it doesn't always go the way I designed it. The same way when teachers do it, it doesn't always go the way they designed it. And we talk about, okay, what do I need to monitor for? What do I need to adjust for? What do we need to revisit? Who needs to revisit it? What would be more meaningful? And those are the very same things that we all want teachers to do. And as we move toward that target so that the five pillars of differentiated instruction are alive and well in each classroom, uh, the quality of, of instruction um, will be consistent classroom to classroom, grade level to grade level, and building to building. And now I'm turning it over to... Say that again? One more. One more slide. Not one more. Oh, it's <laughs> my dear, the leader. I apologize. <laughs> oh, it's perfectly. Linda Wood, who, whose knee isn't cooperating, so she's going to give her part of the presentation from that comfy chair over there. And I thank you all for what you've been sharing thus far. And I just wanted to uh, share with the board very briefly is that I've been on this journey with the strategic planning process. Uh, with Mike and with many members around in this room as a superintendent. And I can, you know how you can sit and you can visually remember uh, moments when we sat in this room and we sat uh, in various rooms talking about the need that we have to meet all of the needs of our students in our district. And in order to do that in a better way, we have to find a more meaningful way of how we deliver that change of learning for our staff in a more meaningful way. And I'm very pleased with what has been unfolding in our district as it relates to our strategic planning vision several years ago. But I also wanted to say something that Mike indicated earlier is that in the process of implementing, you start to gain new ideas and you start to see new areas that can uh, partake or that we can partake in. And one of them that I'd like to highlight right here is what happened in our district as it related to this whole piece of moving from differentiated instruction, which is getting at how do we meet the needs of all of our kids? And how do we help teachers provide a, be a better understanding of how to meet this increasing diversity and increasing diversity of needs? And also knowing that there is a continual increase in the expectations of educators uh, these days. Uh, we've always had it, but we've always, we haven't had to demonstrate it with all of the achievement tests, et cetera. So it was very, uh, a committed interest of mine and those around the table, how do we best support our teachers? 
And one of the things that Alma Dean indicated and highlighted is that so much around what happens in the classroom is related to what teachers believe. And those beliefs needed to be uh, voiced and needed to be discussed. And so one of the things that has unfolded is the fusion of incorporating the principles of national board certification with differentiated instruction as two very, very important models. And they both incorporate what we have learned and implemented in the district around UBD. Our whole curriculum is based on that. And what I want to share with you very quickly, because it is now 10 after 8, and I wrote that on my paper that we would be finished at 10 after 8. Uh, but one of the things that I just really wanted to highlight is that when we have our teachers in the process trying to meet the needs, learn new strategies, and to have an opportunity to reflect on their beliefs, it takes time. <coughs> and the other aspect of that is that it takes a lot of reflection. And one of the very important components of National Board is that teachers have to start looking at their practice themselves. So you probably have heard of many of our teachers beginning to videotape themselves and starting to look and reflect at what they're doing in the classroom as they look at themselves, as they analyze their practice, to describe their practice and reflect on their practice. And they're reflecting based upon the elements of DI, which Terry mentioned, but they're also reflecting on the various propositions that are part of National Board, such as how committed am I to the students and to their learning? These are deep questions that we have to all reflect on as we're thinking about the teaching and the engagement that we're in process of implementing. Helping teachers to really know deeply their subjects and how to teach those subjects. There's something that's very important. You can know your content, but it's critically important that you know how to deliver that content in a deep way because the test, the assessments, the achievement that is expected, the rigor at all levels, is not just surface, it's deep learning and deep teaching. How do you manage and monitor learning? That's another core proposition. What that means is we're, we're not managing and monitoring behavior, we're managing and monitoring learning. And when we can manage and monitor the learning, many of the other factors will dissipate. And so that's very important that, our, that we help support our teachers with that. Um, and we've already talked about the deep practice, and we've talked about that our teachers need to be in learning communities, which we've echoed and resonated already as to what others have said. And this has been done with a very strong focus on generating teacher leadership, not just in the form of PD facilitators, but leaders at all levels in our buildings, along with helping our principals to develop their leadership. And I could um, speak a lot more and bring a lot more connections out, but I don't want to prolong because I know we have a lot uh, still yet to discuss in our agenda for this evening. But Mike, uh, would you like to move forward the next steps, or did you? Well, I, I think that, uh, I, first of all, I want to thank our team. Absolutely. Uh, this is our team that we work with uh, from time to time. What, one of the advantages that I have is, and it's kind of like when, when you don't see children for a while, like I, I have uh, three, three kids and one lives in New York, one lives in Denver, and one lives in Los Angeles. And when you don't see the kids for a while, you oh my goodness, how they grow or how they change. And my experience with the Southfield Public Schools is that, uh, you know, I, I show up every few months and I always ask the Dr. Phil question, which is, you know, how's that working for you? You know, that whole thing. <laughs> How are things going? And uh, I'm kind of the guy that holds everybody's feet to fire by saying, well, what data do you have? What are you been doing? Tell, show me, what, because we're going to have a presentation in the board, as we have tonight. But well, now we know that there are some next steps. And, uh, and I, I'm going to start at the bottom there and just suggest to you that we may want to look at, sometime in the spring, doing some updating of the whole plan. Uh, your next accreditation visit for the, for, for the district accreditation will be a year from this spring. Mm -hmm. And so it may be appropriate to take a look at the current plan and maybe do some uh, significant updating. But I will say this, that there have been significant changes in this district in the last three years. And I think much of it is due to the fact that there is a blueprint that the community, the board adopted, is a blueprint. And it is working, and, and the changes are beginning to occur. What I'm after, and I keep saying this to the team, is show me the data. I'd like to see some data, and we're, we're getting closer and closer to that. 
So if, if you want to just uh, run through these last few bullets, I, I want to I want to thank uh, the team and everyone Absolutely. for our time tonight. Absolutely. Uh, in terms of the last bullet, uh, developing measurement tools of non-instructional areas, actually developing measurement tools in support of all areas, instructional and non-instructional, uh, and we'll be growing in those areas to support and provide that information. But another very important piece is expanding our uh, communication and our support for our parents. Uh, that is a, a major goal that uh, will unfold as we continue to move forward. Another very important piece uh, is examining our grading and assessment procedures and processes in the district, uh, helping everyone to understand um, what grading really means and how it's related to learning and how we're measuring all of that. And then this whole continued conversation uh, as we continue to move forward the quest of teaching for deep understanding. Uh, we don't want our children just to memorize and then be able to regurgitate and later forget, but to have deep understandings and later applications so that it's meaningful for their lives and long-lasting livelihood. So at this moment, I thank you again. Um, we have a lot more work to do. We have a tremendous yeah. amount of work to do. I'm excited about the work and excited about the team. Thank you so much for being on uh, here this evening. Thanks. And thank you, team, for your support.
have in your packet is the federal single audit. And this is the audit of the district's compliance with laws and regulations related to the federal program. It's an important audit because the district receives over $10 million in federal revenue. This report is filed with the state, federal government, and various other agencies. We did have one finding this year, but no question cost. And the process that resulted in the finding has been corrected. Well, your packet also contains a letter to the board, and it contains some of the... There's also a letter to the board that, uh, that contains some uh, additional details on the audit and also some uh, information on school finance. There's nothing tonight that is in that letter that I feel needs to be brought to the board's attention. Before we get on to some of the key numbers in the financial statements, I have a few general uh, financial comments. So in the year into June 30th, 2011, the district had excess revenues and the general fund balance increased to approximately $18 million. In order to get that fund balance, you had to make some very tough decisions. And I remind you that the fund balance is at a specific point in time, which in this case is June 30th, 2011. The district's current projections indicate that $9 million of the fund balance will be used up in this school year and another $15 million in the next school year. <coughs> I commend the board and the administration for making the tough structural changes that you made. Otherwise, it would be very likely that you would be in a very close to a deficit at this point. All the information that's out there now does not lead to any near-term positive changes on the revenue side. Property values continue to decline, enrollment and population continues to decrease, state foundational allowance has been cut dramatically, and federal stimulus funds have been used up. On the expense side, health care costs continue to rise, and the retirement rate is now over 24%. The board and the administration have no control over the items I just discussed. So as hard as decisions have been over the last year, I think you should continue to make the tough decisions on the things that you can control. With that, I'm going to hand it over to my associate, Nate, who's going to discuss some of the details of the uh, financial <coughs> audit. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. Good evening. The first slide shows the variance balance sheets of the district as of June 30, 2011. Uh, the district has many different funds based on the purpose of those funds, but the general fund houses the primary activities of the district. Assets for the general fund totaled approximately $32 million. Included in that balance was cash and investments of $20.6 million, as well as the state aid receivable of $6.6 million. Liabilities totaled $13.7 million. Included in that balance was $3 million of accounts payable, as well as $6.3 million of accrued payroll that was earned prior to June 30th and was paid subsequently. Fund, e fund equity included a non-spendable balance of $458,000, which included uh, inventories of $33,000 and prepaid expenditures of $425,000. Uh, the remainder was assigned, which included accumulated severance obligation to employees of $5.1 <coughs> million, uh, a final ERI payment of $1 million, which was paid in July 2011, uh, anticipated tax appeals that we paid in 2012 of $5 million, approximately $3.8 million was paid during the, the past fiscal year, and lastly, uh, $6.5 million, which relates to the 10% minimum fund balance policy adopted by the board. There wasn't enough to uh, allocate a full 10%, but we did uh, allocate the remainder. That arrives you at the ending fund balance of $18.2 million. Uh, the next slide shows the combined statements of revenue, expenditures, and changes in the fund balance for the year. General fund revenues came in at $111 million.7, uh, 
$111.7 million. Expenditures were $97.5 million. Other financing sources totaled $16,000 for a net change in fund balance of $14.2 million. When factored in the beginning fund balance of $3.9 million, we arrive again at the $18.2 ending fund balance. This next slide shows the revenue for both the general and funded projects funds for the year. It shows where the money came from. Uh, the total revenue was $120.7 million. And uh, you can see the biggest piece of that pie was the state foundation allowance for $92 million. And that really illustrates the district has very little control over the majority of their revenue, as this is uh, determined by the, the equation, the blended pupil count times your per pupil allowance every year. Well, the next slide shows the total expenditures for the general and funded projects funds, which came in at $106.4 million. Uh, the largest item there was salary and benefits at 75% or $79.4 million. And with, with the district being a service industry, your largest cost every year <coughs> is going to be people costs. And going forward, that's going to include your escalating health care costs as well as escalating retirement costs. The next slide shows a uh, comparison of fund balance as a percentage of expenditures uh, for the last five years. You can see that 2011 was the first year that there was an increase to fund balance. Um, the current year percentage of 18.7% can be derived by taking the fund balance of $18.2 million and dividing by your expenditures of $97.5 million. This is above the last published state average of 10.4%, but I will I mentioned, as Diane also mentioned, that there are many hurdles to come in the future, including the budgeted $9 million of expenditures over revenue for 2012, along with the estimated $15 million of expenditures over revenue for 2013. My last slide quantifies the declining enrollment at the district. You can see from 2007 to 2011, there's been a decrease of 1,267 students. Put into the 2011 dollars as far as the foundation allowance, that equates to $14 million of lost revenue. And the $14 million exhibits that this is a, a very impactful thing for the district. And this will continue to be an issue for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Any questions to the board? Joanne and Swensky and Sherry Barker, please stand up real quickly. 
want to recognize them for all of the hard work and many, many hours that they've put into it, compiling the budget and working with the auditors. They've done an awesome job. <laughs> recognized recently from the Association of School of Business Officials International for receiving the Certificate of Excellence in Financial Accounting for the longest time in the state of Michigan. We're one of only two in the state of Michigan that have received it for over 25 years. We're currently at 28 years. So at this time, I would like to present this plaque to President Buchanan showing all of the 28 years that we have received. <laughs>
provided 1,807 breakfast meals, over 2,000 lunches, and 2,000 snacks to families. Bus Safety Week was a success. Students learned bus etiquette, safe passenger rules, and more. Interestingly, now, Bus Seat's Head Start transportation numbers are up to 33 children. Donuts for Dads is still scheduled, and Fire Safety will be their theme. November 16th, volunteer training. November 21st, asthma training. A representative will discuss asthma triggers, what to do in the event of attacks, and helpful information for parents with children who have asthma. Additionally, on that day, the kids will be celebrate, celebrating grandparents. That's November 21st. November 22nd, Native American Day, and students will learn about Native Americans, how they dress, how important they are to our land, etc. Forgotten Harvest will start as soon as they obtain more trucks. Some problems are ongoing with their current fleet. Regional conference occurred in Miss Hill informed that Head Start has rigorous family engagement mandates. Most people will work hard to engage families. Ms. Shereen Barker uh, so gave the budget report. Financial representatives for the grant reported that 25% of the grant has been used mostly on training, salaries, and benefits. The total budget is $1,294,451. To date, $976,132 remain. There was $11,000 less available to the grant for Great Start. However, we are able to still pick up the shortfall. The next policy council meeting will be November 29, 2011, at 9.30 a.m. <laughs> and Dr. Robinson, I was wondering if I might take 62 seconds and have uh, uh, Chairperson Gator just briefly mention about the um, regional conference he attended. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I just want to say that uh, going to the conference was it was a treasure trove of information that we would bring back to uh, the bus here start. Also uh, down there, uh, Southfield, we received uh, regional recognition and uh, also um, uh, you know uh, as a representative going down to Southfield. Um, we able to, you know, we turned some heads and, and got a lot of people, uh, got, got, gave Southfield some exposure, and uh, I was uh, rewarded, was that the Yeah, I was rewarded, uh, uh, you know, his, um, uh, what was that? <laughs> a pie, a pie plate and cover. A pie plate and cover because I enjoy making pie. <laughs> <laughs> Also, because when I went down, I took the time to help out with the conference, and uh, we were South was recognized, and they uh, uh, mentioned our program, and the uh, uh, Ohio delegation also uh, gave us recognition of uh, South Hill Plus the Head Start, uh, also along with just a uh, picture that they showed uh, to the uh, all the other uh, delegates that were there. I just want to say, Ms. Robinson, I thank you so much for the wisdom of, of calling that and making it happen. And uh, everyone knows I think you got a wonderful team here and Buzzy. I mean, we're, we're making a splash and it's a lot of good things. <coughs> and I just want to appreciate everyone on the, uh, uh, the, the governing board for working with us and just taking us under your wings. I want to thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Mr. President, I'd also like to add that the Policy Council had training last month on um, technical assistance on their role and, and how to run meetings, and they have also offered to train the board. They would like for us to come and attend training as the governing board to better understand our role in supporting the Policy Council. So Ms. Christian will be sending out an email asking for dates uh, <laughs> when we are all available for that training. Um, next we're moving to unfinished business. And uh, we, uh, at this point, we wanted to uh, put into the record for the community evaluation summary for um, Superintendent uh, Dr. Wanda Robinson. Before we start, I like this one. This binder represents all of the activities uh, of our superintendent over the past year. So as you can see, she's very detailed in, uh, in her record keeping. Um, but this is also significant in demonstrating to the, to the board and to the community uh, exactly how much
much work goes into running South Hill Public Schools. So uh, with that, I'd like to have uh, the Secretary read the evaluation uh, for the record. The superintendent's evaluation concentrated in five basic areas, leadership, accountability, alignment, community school relationships, board superintendent relationships. In the area of leadership, Dr. Wanda Cook Robinson is a proven leader who leads from the front by an example. By example, leadership has been described as the process of social influence in which one person can enlist the aid and support of others in the accomplishment of a common task. This has been demonstrated in all areas of her job performance, i.e., community partnerships, educational relationships, professional development, etc. Dr. Cook. Robinson has demonstrated outstanding leadership qualities by advocating on behalf of South Hill Public Schools on the city, county, and state level, as well as out of the country on a global basis. <laughs> she holds her team of administrators accountable for the academic development of our students. Dr. Cooper Robinson creates a work environment that promotes leadership, professionalism, personal responsibility, collaboration, and enthusiasm for the mission of the schools. Under the area of accountability, accountability is often used synonymously, synonymously with such concepts as responsibility, ability, blameworthiness, liability, and other terms associated with the expect expectations of account giving. <coughs> Dr. Cook Robson has demonstrated that ultimately she is the one for everything but gives credit where credit is due. One responsible for everything but gives credit where credit is due. On a number of occasions, Dr. Wanda Cook Robson has given recognition to those that have performed outstandingly under her leadership. These accomplishments have been achieved in the face of an <coughs> ever-changing economic climate. But somehow and by some way, she has been able to get done what was required. The board has kept abreast of recommended resource allocation throughout the calendar year. Dr. Cook Robinson takes responsibility and formulates appropriate plans of action. In the area of alignment, Dr. Cook Robinson has aligned the needed resources and services necessary to support the vision and goals of the Southfield Public School. She has done this in a manner that has allowed for the achievement of all students. Dr. Cook Robinson has done an outstanding job of making sure that district curriculum and standards are aligned with state and federal standards and adjusted as necessary. Staff development concentrates on differentiated instructions Help me out there, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> to, move, to meet the different needs of students. Our schools are now equipped to serve all students. Under the area of community school relationships, Dr. Cook Robinson benefits from a community school relationship that is superb. She is very visible in the community and is present at a variety of events throughout the entire year. The community seems to be in sync with the superintendent. She responds to all community mail and requests in a very timely and fair manner. She has been involved in the community as evidenced by the many community organizations that she holds leadership positions in, i.e. Field Zone and the Southfield Foundation, let's name a couple. She works well with the state and local government officials and staffs, as well as other community groups and organizations. She is totally immersed in the community and working very hard to involve and keep, keep the community informed. She is focused on telling our story. Board Superintendent Relationship. Dr. Cook Robinson communicates with the board effectively and maintains a collegial and professional relationship with all members of the board. She does an outstanding job of informing the board about important matters of the district. She makes it a point to keep the entire board informed of what is going on in the district and all matters that relate to Southfield Public Schools. She keeps the board informed and is very proactive in keeping the board ahead of the concerns and problems. Additional comments, Dr. Cook Robinson, we look forward to future success under your leadership and the support of your administrative team for the Southfield Public Schools. 
for that evaluation, and I want to share with you that it is an honor and a pleasure to serve with this team. You make it easy in a very, very difficult environment. You are a supportive board, you're an understanding board, but you're a little bit tough sometimes. <laughs> but I want to thank you for that evaluation. Well deserved. Well deserved, Dr. Kimball. Okay, let's get to the business. Uh, I want to ask for a motion to open and approve the consent agenda. Mr. President, I move that we open the consent agenda. Second. We moved and supported. Are there any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Secretary, please call for the vote. Madam Vice President? Yes. Trustee Smith? Yes. Myself? Yes. Trustee Robinson? Yes. Trustee Poole? Yes. Trustee Lewis? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a motion to open and approve report 50 22, the award of the Adler Boiler bid. Motion to open and approve report 50.3, uh, 
resolution to protect the school aid fund revenue. Mr. President, I move to reopen report 5023. Okay. Um, I guess we need to be the record, so it's Resolution to protect school aid fund revenue by District of Southfield Public Schools. Whereas education is the cornerstone of a successful economic turnaround and investment in education is the key to a new Michigan. And Whereas the children of Michigan deserve educational opportunities that allow them to compete on a national and international basis. And whereas the long-term economic health of our state and opportunity for our citizens is conditioned on meaningful structural reform to provide stable and fair funding for education. And whereas the personal property tax repeal called for by SB 34, that's the Senate Bill 34, would amend the General Property Tax Act to exempt all personal property from the collection of taxes levied after December 31, 2011. And whereas Senate Bill 34 would reduce by over $550 million the available funding to schools statewide. And whereas Senate Bill 34 would increase the tax burden on homeowners because of the loss of personal property tax debt millage. And whereas Senate Bill 34 would result in a loss of $4,031,764 in collected utility personal property tax revenue directly affecting all of Oakland County Schools. And whereas Senate Bill 34 would result in a loss of approximately $60 per pupil in PA 18 distributions from Oakland Intermediate School District. And whereas Senate Bill 34 would result in a loss of $1,266,000 in collected personal property tax debt village revenue for the Southfield Public Schools. And whereas Senate Bill 34 would result in a loss of $420,000 in collected <coughs> personal property tax whole harmless millage revenue for the Southfield Public Schools. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education for Southfield Public Schools expect the governor and legislature to fully replace the revenues lost through proposed cuts to the personal property tax or oppose Senate Bill 34. And be it further resolved that the Board of Education for the Southfield Public Schools expects the governor and legislature to meet their constitutional responsibility to the children of this state and focus on the perennial and structural deficit that plagues school finance in Michigan. And be it further resolved, the board directs its secretary to send copies of this resolution to the governor and the state legislative delegation representing this school district. <coughs> and then I hereby certify that the foregoing is a full, true, and correct copy of a resolution duly passed and adopted by the Board of Education for the Southfield Public Schools at a meeting thereof held on the 8th day of November 2011 by the following vote of the trustees thereof. Uh, ayes and in favor thereof and nays are supposed to be counted and listed here and signed by our secretary. Thank you. Thank you. What in fact uh, we're doing here is we're uh, sending or letting it be known to uh, legislature that we oppose uh, Senate Bill 34 uh, and the um, very significant impact that negative impact that it's going to have uh, on this community as well as others across the state. Um, and uh, with that, please. Uh, 
It may have been voted on a committee already. Was it? The committee meeting was today. Yes. And the Board of Education met today, too, in my opinion. Uh, so now it has to go to the Senate. <coughs> if it's voted on a committee, it stands a chance of being passed. So the community should be aware that <coughs> it really calls for community action if we don't want this bill to be passed out of the Senate. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Mr. Secretary, you call for votes. Trustee Lewis? Yes. Trustee Poole? Yes. Trustee Robinson? Yes. Trustee Smith? Yes. Myself? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Now, Mr. President? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll now, I'll take a motion to open and approve the Board 50 24 resolution for service consolidation plan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Trustee Robinson? Yes. Trustee Poole? Yes. Trustee Lewis? Yes. Madam Vice President? Yes. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, we have some information items here now requiring action by the board. Uh, report 7A, uh, Report 50 27, which is a purchasing report. Uh, any purchases that are made by the district that do not meet the threshold of uh, $5,000 do not require any action from the board. Uh, those items are listed uh, there for, uh, for your rules and understanding. Uh, report 7B is a uh, gift to the board, which I find interesting. It's a 1989 Volvo sedan with extra vehicle parts was donated to Southfield High School Engineering Program. The estimated value was $2,200. <laughs> Actually, it has 1989 Volvo <laughs> 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 um, Okay. Now we come to the public participation. Uh, portion of the meeting. Uh, comments are generally limited to three minutes. The board will listen to all comments but may not respond during the meeting. Comments may be referred to an administrator or the superintendent for follow-up. As a matter of fairness, speakers with complaints against individuals <coughs> have not to mention persons by name. Mm -hmm. Complaints concerning employees should be brought to the attention of school principals or other administrators before coming to the board. The cooperation is appreciated. We'll ask that you, um, when your name is called, please step to the microphone and uh, state your name and address. And first we have Danielle Green. <laughs> Even 
so spouses may be acting within um, the legal parameters. Yeah. We know that we can do, um, we know that our children deserve more. Thank you. <laughs> Next we have uh, Marcia Rogers. Or is it Marcia? Marcia. Marcia Rogers. Don't make that mistake. You're okay. I get that all the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Um, good evening. Again, my name is Marcia Rogers. I live at 28330 Ranchwood Drive, Southfield, Michigan, 48076. And um, I'm also one of the parents of Ty Rogers, who's in second grade. He was actually here earlier, but I sent him home <laughs> because he had to go to, go to school now. And um, we, as one of the parents just indicated, we have tried to go through that, the correct avenue to get our complaint uh, heard. And I just want to bring up the, the communication process, which at this time has just been really despicable. Um, we, our parents was not notified that our children would be in a classroom of kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, the director indicated that she had sent out a letter in May. None of the parents that I talked to, or, or even in this room, received the letter um, stating that it was going to be a meeting in June to discuss it. The director indicated that no one showed up at the meeting, and of course, no one got the letter. And I believe if, this, if the parents had got this letter in May, we would be sitting here 10 weeks into class with our students not being trained properly. As we indicated, they are not meeting their IEPs, and it feels like that our, our kids are actually being taught by just high educated, high, high qualified babysitters and not educators. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have Kareem doing but uh, big. <laughs> um, my name is Kareem Dillard Big. My address is twenty four two nine one Lathrop four eight zero seven five. Um, my my concern is more so a question. As a parent of a child um, in this um, modern CI class. When will he have the teacher? Has the teacher been hired? When will the teacher start? And the other question that I have is, what will be done to make up for the lost time that our children have not received the benefit? I listen to your wonderful um, the implementation of your strategic plan. I listen to all this wonderful training that teachers are receiving. Our children are not receiving the benefits of this. And I want to know what's going to be done to make up for the lost time. Thank you, ma'am. Um, we'll make sure that um, um, your your questions are answered. You will receive a response uh, from the superintendent's office in regards to this matter. Yes, I can give information this afternoon. Okay. Hopefully all the parents. Well, first of all, let me say that it is unfortunate what has happened. We apologize to those parents that your children have had to have substitute teachers but there was a personnel issue involved. We could not discuss that personnel issue with parents. So that also caused us some communication problems because we couldn't share a lot of that information. So there have been subs in that room. Uh, at first the substitute was simply a certified teacher and then at the request of parents for a qualified certified teacher, meaning a teacher who was certified in MOCHI or moderately cognitively impaired to be in that classroom, that's so the response. I also had an opportunity a week ago last Monday to go into that classroom. I think I shared that update with the board. I spent three hours there uh, to observe and then met with the special ed director the next day to discuss what we needed to do to support that classroom. We ended the guest teacher on last Friday. HR worked with us to call a teacher back from recall who was highly certified in that area and was placed in the classroom on Monday. We have hired a teacher and that communication went out from Ms. Bard on Friday, November 4th, announcing the parents that we have hired a teacher. Her name is Veronica Tate. She has a variety of experiences and, and she is highly qualified in this area. She will start November 14th. 
It is our plan to have the transition teacher who is there now and the newly hired, te hired teacher in that classroom until December 16th, which, which is when we go for the break. And then I will go back into that classroom with Ms. Barr and we will do another assessment. So we will have two certified teachers in that classroom and three paraprofessionals. That will be five instructional adults for 13 children. We will do that until, as I said, December 16th. Then we will, I will go and start back in the classroom <coughs> and do another assessment for next steps. But it was unfortunate, the parents are absolutely right, that 10 weeks have went by when we didn't have a permanent teacher in that classroom. Thank you. Um, I would just like to say that uh, I've experienced some of these issues myself. When you have personnel issues that are involved in, in contracts and things of that nature, it does cause a lot of problems in trying to move people around. Uh, my son, when he was, I think, in the third grade, um, just prior to school starting, uh, we had two teachers transfer. They didn't leave the district. They transferred within the district. But he didn't have a, he didn't have a teacher for the entire period of his first card march. And it's unfortunate, but those things do happen. Uh, hopefully, what the superintendent has proposed will work for you, and we can put this um, this issue, you know, to rest. And uh, we'll be working with you. I mean, this the one thing that you have to understand about this board. This board is, you know, uh, very transparent. We work with the community and try to resolve issues. We don't run from them. Uh, this is difficult. And I know that, you know, right now it may just seem like, you know, we, we're not rushing this off. Uh, we've been aware of it, we've been kept aware of it, uh, but she is our educational leader for the district and all the responsibility lies with her. And so, um, hopefully going forward, you'll get a better resolution to uh, this issue. All right, we now come to the board matters. Uh, and. Uh, this board is able to share information with the community, and we'll start with Ms. Smith. Partnership 
for Leadership and Success, McIntyre Elementary School. And those are all programs that these schools participated in. The ones that were nominated for awards are as follows. Community Relations, Getting to the Root of It All, Morris Adler Elementary, Journalism, Southfield High, and I So our schools are awesome. They did a great job. And we want to commend them. And thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson.
courses, which there are nine, was developed as a core curriculum for board member certification. Completion of the entire series is required to be received your first level certification, the certified board award or distinction. All the things that are going on in this district, this district deserves an honor board, and I will not stop until that happens. And everyone on this board remembers that's what we agreed to do, and I expect that to happen. Board members are more effective and informed when developing or dealing with the legislative process, policies, school finances and school budgets, basic school law, curriculum and instructions, labor relations, and community relations and board governance for data, data, data informed decision making. That's what we're all about here. So once we all complete our level 100, as Robert, Trustee Robinson stated, we'll be your honor board for South Dakota School District. Then there are 18 200 level courses and nine 300 level courses. I too want to be a board, will be a master level certified board member before my tenure is up. So tonight, and at every one of our board meetings, I think you see why I am so very proud to serve on this board. We have an outstanding board, an outstanding school district. And at the conference, when I said, well, you know, if someone discussed a problem, I said, we don't have that problem in Southfield. They'd say, oh, well, Southfield. You know, like our name is already out there. People understand who we are because of our superintendent who has testified, because of our financial situation, but mostly because of what our students do. Now, I would like to tell the community, and you well know this, I'm not telling you something you don't know, that we cannot run this district without money. Our programs cost money. And our teachers are worthy of their salaries. We can't make them make sacrifices to run a school district all the time. We have to educate our children and do it the best way we can. It takes dollars. You heard me read the resolution on Senate Bill 34. That's not all that's happening in this state. If bad things are happening, we need the community to get involved. There was a letter, the Free Press was kind enough to publish my letter on Sunday. Did anybody see it? Letter to the editor? Well, it talked about charter schools. Do you know there are 17 charter schools in Oakland County and nine of them are in Southfield? And every child who lives in Southfield and goes to a charter school is taking the foundation allowance with him or her. And they do not do the job that we do. They don't have an ASA lab and a robotics team and academies that are outstanding. Everything we do just seems to me so outstanding. They don't have those things. And we need to make the state understand the damage that charter schools are doing to a district like Southfield. Really. And they push us to the wall every year. Dr. Cook Robinson did not sleep for nights at a time because she was worried about where she was going to find the cuts in our educational process. So we have charter schools. We have movements to punish unions. I can only say that they're trying to punish unions. We are no longer allowed to collect union dues. And you know that's a computer generated thing. It's the easiest thing to collect union dues. They want to have right to work. I spoke about that last month. The right to work state. And the union people have to fight that. A right to work state means that if you get a job in a unionized district, you don't have to join the union or pay dues to it. Well, if you're getting all the benefits like health care, which every human being should have, it's a human right to have health care. You know, somebody has to pay for it. Somebody paid to get it for you. So, and there are multiple, multiple things that they're doing. They want to privatize teachers. We have an outstanding staff in Southfield. We can't do what you heard described this evening without outstanding people. If they privatize the teachers, they're going to have to pay for it. Thank you. Thank you.
privatized teaching, you know, every one of your complaints will be multiplied many times. We heard a plea from special ed uh, parents that, you know, if you think it, if we have problems now, it's going to get much worse. And we do recognize your problems and do our best to solve them. We care for our students, we care for the product, the graduates, and we need your help. You need to contact your legislators and complain in a clear, loud voice that education is untouchable. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cat. Um, I, I concur with all of the uh, points that have been made by my colleagues tonight. Um, public education is under assault in this in this country, not just here in the state of Michigan. And we all need to understand that the, uh, free public education is the cornerstone of our democracy. The things that are going on right now are going to change the very core of how we live or the things that we have become accustomed to here in America. If we don't stand up in, in, in a loud <coughs> voice to say that we're not going to just go for this, will be contributing to our own demise. Uh, it's a new day. We are actually um, going to make a joint statement um, with our bargaining units. And this has got to be a first, where we actually have the union, as well as the administration, the board, saying in one voice that we stand together, that we are going to challenge uh, these, these things that are coming and these things seem to be coming faster. It's, it's, as soon as you think it's over, there's more coming and more. There's an agenda here to, you know, turn back the clock, it seems like, and we can't just sit by like sheep and let this happen. Part of the education, I believe, that has to take place is activism. We have to teach our young people how to stand up, how to stand up for themselves, and we do that by our example. You will see in the coming weeks this board making that statement, and hopefully we'll have others join with us to say that we are united in, against this assault on public education. I want to lighten things up a little bit. Yes, I say one more thing. Yes. Today is November the 8th, Election Day. Right. I was in the polls. Only a few hundred people had voted at Thompson, but when I was there at 4 o'clock, we have, to, I, mean, I know I appreciate the choir here. You are the people who come to our meetings if you want to care. But we have to instill in our young people how important voting is. Because the reason we have this problem is because those people were elected by the electorate. Because not everybody went out to vote. You have to vote, your children have to vote, and you have to tell your neighbors how to vote. If they don't know, tell them. Yeah. Well, this is the most important thing we do. Sarah, I've got one most important thing. <coughs> I had the honor and privilege today to uh, escort Dr. Cindy Stanton from um, Livingstone College to both high schools to recruit band and vocal students. And um, there were 11 students from South High and South Labor. And they each were offered um, scholarship dollars. Mm -hmm. And South Hill Labor, um, students received a uh, $56,000 scholarship. Stop their high $61,000. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Um, and within that same vein, um, <laughs> you know, getting back to the, I like to tell them, lighten up, we talk about our students. South Hill High um, just won the district championship uh, last Saturday uh, when they defeated Parmesan. Actually, smashed them when I was playing. And uh, final score was 27-9. Uh, uh, but uh, we're playing now for the regional and uh, regional championship. That's this Saturday at one o'clock. Please come out. I mean, you're going to see, you know, some very talented um, people, and they're not just not just the athletes on the field. You see the band perform. Uh, I mean, just everything. It was a it was a gorgeous day. Saturday, and you know, we need to have more of the community come out and see it. I mean, that's the thing that builds community, and that's what's making this community special. 
So, Saturday, it's 1 o'clock, South Carolina, we're playing against Birmingham Brother Rice, and uh, it's going to be a big game. I think the weather should hold up from what I'm seeing right now, so it'll be a good time for everybody. So please, please, please come out. All right, um, future meetings, uh, November 22nd and 30th, and student hearings, December 13th is the next regular board meeting. I got you. Uh, board, we have to go into closed session. So I'll take a motion. We're going to recess, but I'll take a motion to go into closed session. 